Welcome back everybody. Today I wanted to do a little bit of a different kind of piece of content. Normally I do guides and stuff, but today I wanted to do a general use 1.1 tier list for the characters in Grand Blue Fantasy. Now, before you get your pitchforks out, to be clear, this is actually a tier list that I'm doing in collaboration with Starmie. If you don't know Starmie, super, super gamer has soloed a number of the fights in Grand Blue Fantasy, which is something that I've never been able to do because I stink at the game. If you're interested in their content, feel free to check them out. But the 1.1 general use tier list was a collaboration between myself and Starmie. Let's get into it. So first and foremost, as you can see, I'll give you a bit of a rundown or a bit of a sneak peek as to what the two lists look like. We have S plus through B because no character in the game is so bad that they're unplayable. A lot of these characters have a few different niches or sometimes they're a little bit weaker in certain positions, but by no means are any of these characters unplayable. This is my tier list. As you can see here, I've labeled it with Kana's tier list, but below here we have a tier list, including Starmie's thoughts, but there are a few caveats to this tier list, mainly the fact that Starmie isn't super familiar with Gondagoza and the captain and Rackham, but that's okay. Okay, because fortunately or unfortunately, I have experience with these characters, and that's what I'll use to supplement the sections where Starmie isn't as familiar with the sections. In general, though, we went back and forth about what the criteria or what the different placements of characters were. Let's actually get into the tier list and what the criteria are to begin with. Starmie and I decided to collaborate on a tier list for 1.1, and the criteria, as you read out from the Discord message, is that it is based on damage consistency or safety, uh, crowd control, utility or team support, SBA gain. So long story short, the idea behind it is how good are they at doing damage? How versatile are they? And what do they really bring to the table as characters in Grand Blue Fantasy? Another important note about the stylus is that we are assuming that these characters are being played at peak performance. For the sake of this video, we decided to equalize the general skill level so that wasn't so much of a factor. Let's move on. Okay, now if you take a look at the tier list for even a second, you'll notice that a lot of the top tiers, the S pluses, the S's, the A pluses, all kind of share similar positions. And it's kind of clear at this point why that is. Between myself and Starmie, we both agree that Lancelot is kind of ridiculous. And to quote, this character is pretty much the most versatile character that Grand Blue Fantasy has to offer. In addition to the fact that he's kind of spamming your ears in 24 seven, spamming hya hya and not getting hit through fights like Lucilius or Maglael and Galanza. This character has crowd control, has decent damage, has basically immortality because of the fact that he's so evasive and so maneuverable. All on top of the fact that you can even use a sigil like flight over fight and still reach his damage caps, meaning that you can actually have a bit more flexibility in your build. All of these together really make him one of the most ridiculous characters that I've ever seen. And again, there's not much to deviate between my and Sarmi's opinion on this. It's kind of obvious if you see Lancelot being played at all, and outside of something like Vulcan Bolo where you kind of want high damage and you can't freeze at all, this character has no weak fights whatsoever. Now, unfortunately, this next section is going to look kind of similar because, again, like I said, fact is fact, the high tiers are high tiers for good reason, and it doesn't take much effort to kind of look at these characters and understand why they're so strong. Io has so much flexibility in terms of being ranged while also having stuns, while also having a load of SBA gain, while also doing insane damage when no other character can basically hit the boss in fights like Proto Bahamut, or basically any time that the boss or any bosses or mobs are flying in the sky. And for Vasaraga, look no further than the character that does more damage than pretty much any other character in Grand Blue Fantasy, just because of the way that his charge and his less is more build and basically spamming his heavy attack instead of actually using skills works on this character. Now again, as per what Starmie says, it is also very true that outside of the insane damage that a character like Io or Vasaraga do. A lot of these characters just have things that basically no other character can do. Now again, Io, like I mentioned previously, can shoot from far away. Most other characters outside of, again, your fringe Rackham case or your Eugen case don't really have access to hitting characters that are flying in the sky. Mobs like the flying drones in Pieta or hitting Proto Bahamut when he's flying away is something that pretty much only the ranged characters in the game have access to. And even then, Io does it way better than a lot of the other characters. And moving along to Vasaraga, if you just take a look at how much damage this character does, if you've ever used parsers, if you've ever seen how much damage he does to the to the test dummy, pretty much anything in between. He has infinite damage, he has immortality, he has a load of stun power as well. And again, just seeing one of his charge attacks do something like over a million per hit is just super satisfying and ultimately why he lands in the S tier alongside Io. Now, personally, I felt that putting Io and Vasaraga together were really important because they're basically the apex of the game outside of Lancelot, who is pretty much the god of the game. And I mean, at that point, you know, you, you, you kind of need your own category. Now for the A plus tier, unlike the S plus tier or the S tier, I will be going individually into each character and describing what their strengths are or what their weaknesses are, specifically because unlike an S tier where there's so much above or there's pretty much no weaknesses to be had for the character, 
characters. For a character like Oigen, Narmaya, Charlotta, and Cagliostro, they definitely do have moments where they shine very brightly. So let's get into the A plus tier. Now, if you haven't played or seen Oigen, one of the most ridiculous aspects of this character's kit is the fact that you can actually dodge, roll, and spam grenades in certain fights, which makes him do infinitely more damage than any other character in the game. Now, if you played Oigen at all, something that you might consider to be arguably his highest value is his big laser beam that he can do. But if you've also played even one second of him, you know that trying to aim the Sumrak laser beam is absolutely ridiculous because you end up just having insane recoil and it's damn near impossible to actually control. However, although this is a general use tier list, I will say that the Sumrak Beam does a load of work and is incredible, especially if you're using Oigen as AI. But if we're talking specifically about the general use tier list, one of the great ways that you can actually play Oigen is through spamming his grenades and you'll dodge or you'll block and then you dodge and then you throw out your grenade and you kind of spam this. If you're in a fight like Proto Bahamut or if you're in a stationary fight where you can back up against a wall and throw grenades at the boss and this alongside things like the paralyzed bullet which is great for crowd control and of course the addition of flurry or bullet rain makes him one of the most insane characters to play although i don't think a lot of people like the way that he looks because he kind of just looks like it's not a husband like a super super k-poppy looking husbando or a waifu that is no reason to sleep on him because honestly this character is absolutely ridiculous i promise you if you try this character for at least five to ten minutes you'll see just how ridiculous his damage output is and ultimately if you get really lucky and you have something like the bullet rain come down all at the same time or if you're kind of annoyed at trying to land the glaciite because the boss moves around look no further than pretty much a directed bullet in order to number one land your crowd control and if you end up having the bullet rain land on the same enemy all at the same time you do insane damage alongside your grenade dodge roll canceling combo and that for me lands him at the a plus tier a load of versatility he has cc and outside of the fact that some is kind of hard to use he's insane just use the grenade spam now if we move along to narmaya not only is this character Character dubbed by most people in the game the goat primarily because you know the horns and also because she's one of the most waifu characters that the game has to offer she also has a really really fun playstyle that drastically becomes less and less fun the more and more you realize that most of the bosses won't ever let you throw off a setsuna or actually respect the fact that you need to charge up abilities and hit but that aside i'll leave it to starmie to really analyze this narmaya character because honestly although i've definitely seen how strong this character is she does a load of damage she has decent mobility and she also has a bunch of hidden tech or hidden potential with buffing herself and also dodging. I'll leave it to the Narmaya player who can solo Magliel and Galanza and Lucilius to tell you just how strong this character is. From Starmie's POV as the resident Narmaya main or expert, Narmaya in Starmie's words is pretty much just a great DPS and I kind of have to agree. Although I do like the way that she plays and it does feel kind of nice to have stuff like stout heart or selfish individual buffs that kind of make her easier or more enjoyable to play. At the end of the day, she does nothing that a character like Vasaraga wouldn't already do outside of maybe being a little bit more flexible on certain fights but given that both narmaya and vasaraga do on occasion have to charge up skills or brute force through certain mechanics so that they can get off high big damage skills and stuff like that it does feel like there isn't a great reason for you to pick someone like narmaya especially if you already have access to or you're familiar with the character like vasaraga that being said her damage is still very significant it is among the highest in the game but outside of the fact that she gives damage she doesn't really provide anything else of value and so even though I, myself, and everyone I'm sure knows that Narmaya is one of the high tiers of the game in terms of just dealing damage. In terms of team utility, SBA gain, etc., it's not nearly as insane as some of the other characters on this list. So at the very best, we can only put her in the A plus tier, which is still pretty good. Now, alongside Oigen and Narmaya in the A plus tier is Charlotta. And if you haven't seen this character in action, she's also really insane to play. She's got a bunch of evasion. She's got a load of damage into her kit. And outside of a few techs that you need to learn, this character is pretty straightforward and arguably one of the most insane, versatile damage dealing characters that the game has to offer. Now, even if you take a moment to look at the different skills that Charlotta has access to, she has a attack buffs she has damage cut not that you're going to use each of these but redistribution of sba gauge invincibility a bunch of damage you would imagine that this character alongside maybe a character like percival or a siegfried all do around the same damage because they offer a load of buffs or they offer a lot of team-wide support but completely unexpectedly this character actually has an insane amount of damage especially if you do the cancel where you don't fully fly into the air when you're doing one of your spins this character is absolutely ridiculous in terms of dps 
But in terms of being able to beat up a character like Lucilius, not only do you have a load of DPS because obviously you want to do damage to bosses and get through the fights quickly, but you also just have access to a literal invincibility, which you would think decreases the amount of damage or lowers her total DPS output when it comes to actually playing her. But that's just not the case. Not only does she have self buffs she has the invincibility she does a load of damage and honestly in terms of evasion and her overall mobility it's absolutely ridiculous side note how you choose to get the invincibility or how you get it whether it's through parry and counter or invincible that's totally up to you but just keep in mind that this character is extremely versatile has a load of damage and has a load to offer when it comes to the team wow what a ridiculous character now given that i myself have not been spending too much time farming specifically with charlotta i'll leave it to starmy who describes charlotta specifically as again a great dps which which is kind of a, a common trait for all the high tiers at this point, but also they have a load of safety in their kit, which again makes sense because damage cut, invincibility, a load of different defensive options. But also if you're just good at dealing with Lucilius right now, you're pretty much good at dealing with the end game or like the meta relevant content when it comes to Grand Blue Fantasy. So having that as a major benefit or plus to playing the character is just huge. And finally, the last character to round out the top tier, like the top half of this tier list is Cagliostro. And if you aren't already familiar with this character, she is the buff queen. I guess technically buff uncle, whatever you want to call it. But in terms of the other characters on this list, a lot of these characters give slightly important or slightly relevant buffs to the team, either damage cut on occasion, they give CC or they increase your total SBA generation. But ultimately with Cagliostro, she completely redefines what it means to act Actually give a buff in the most literal sense of that word now for other characters in grand blue fantasy you can give something like attack buff or defense buff or crit chance buff whatever it is and so long as you have that up you can replenish it or you can replace it but ultimately they don't stack they simply just replace each other but kagliosho's buffs actually stack with all of the buffs which is absolutely ridiculous because again if you have something like a really difficult to cap skill or damage dealing ability you can just stack the attack buff of one character with another and you'll actually gain value from having double or like an a greater attack buff if you want to call it but just the fact that the buffs on kagliosho herself stack unlike like any other character in the game immediately puts her in the top tier because no other character in the game does exactly what she does and again that's the characteristic of whether it be through dps utility sba gain or just overall flexibility that kind of makes up the top tier aka the s plus to the a plus characters now additional input from sarmi about how their experience with kagliosho goes is kind of similar to i'm sure how most people feel about kagliosho you see phantasmagoria you see the sba gain you see a kagliosho on your team and you instantly smile because ultimately everyone has the power fantasy of wanting to do damage or get buffed up or do infinite damage whether that's through crit chance attack buffs defense buffs whatever and ultimately like starmy says although there isn't a whole lot of damage that comes out of this character there is simply no no better feeling the game than being buffed up being told okay guys let's do like a huge burst window and being able to one shot or do like one to two million damage with your high burst damage skills all because your kagliosho decided to buff you up okay now while the top tier are definitely kind of typical or a lot of people are familiar with what the high tiers of the game are the mid to low tiers are definitely what i think a lot of people are curious about in terms of where they stand with their mains or how good certain characters are or how excited you should be when you see certain people on your team don't bully anyone by the way you know if they're, if they're playing their favorite character don't bully them so i know i had just kind of described each of the individual characters of the a plus and the value of each of the characters and each of these characters are very different but there's actually a bit of a clump within the a tier in the form of yodarha Catalina and Vayne that I think it's actually important to kind of make a distinction about. Now credit where credit is due, Starmie kind of opened my eyes to this because I hadn't realized how similar these three characters technically were if you look at their kit just in terms of what most people play or how people play these characters. And a very common trait across all three characters is simply the fact that these three characters all have some form of team-wide invincibility or protection. And although each of these characters does have access to this protection, the way that they play and the things that kind of differentiate them from each other actually matter quite a bit. So first and foremost, let's talk about Yorha. Now, this character is definitely very evasive. He's very aloof. And although he feels a little bit worse, in my opinion, than a character like Charlotta, who is literally just spinning all the time, does infinite damage and has selfish invincibility, he does make up for this fact by, again, providing team-wide invincibility in the form of mirror image, while also providing decent DPS in the form of his chain in the ninjutsu, where he kind of gets like an invincibility frame. 
game. To be clear, when I did my challenge video where I ended up just using Theodorha and three waifus, this was one of the most frustrating characters to play in terms of timing, just because the timing of his skill where you have to consistently press at the perfect time was a little bit more difficult than I've seen from anyone that's commented about the playstyle of Charlotta. But ultimately, comparing the two is not the point of this because one of the characters has AoE invincibility and the other doesn't. Instead, comparing it to a character like Vayne, who may not have the same damage output as a character like Yoraha, but has stun and one of the most insane invincibilities in the form of the bubble is super crazy. Now again, Starmie makes great points here in terms of the actual pros and cons of each of the characters. And before we even get to Catalina, just in terms of Yoraha, good DPS, again, very safe, kind of a common trait for characters that have invincibility or evasion built into their kit. But also, again, if you've had any experience with playing with a Yoraha, which I know most people don't, but if you ever played with or actually had the mirror image buff on your team, it feels super, super good. But if you compare Yoraha to Vayne, who again, doesn't do quite as much DPS, but has additional stun value, which again, a character like Yoraha doesn't really have access to because he's kind of flying around and doing a load of DPS. You can kind of start differentiating where or when you would pick or you would prefer one character as opposed to another. Now, ultimately, if you're playing your main because you love the character, this doesn't really apply, but if you had to rate the characters or decide when to pick one character or the other, but if you do have a fight where you need a load of stun power, you should definitely take Vayne over Yoraha. But another really important distinction to know or to make about Vayne and all the invincibilities is that not all all of them are exactly the same. Now, in terms of duration, in terms of whether or not your animation locked, in terms of if it affects your rotations, each of these invincibilities do something different. And as you can see with Vayne, this bubble is absolutely ridiculous. But ultimately, as you can read here, it says that you do have to hold while casting if you want to prolong the duration. So in terms of DPS increase or DPS loss, there are situations where Vayne's bubble may or may not be more valuable depending on how much you actually need the invincibility. If you've ever seen the meta speedrunning strats for Pieta, you know that Vayne's rampart is super, super essential because the only way for you to continuously hit Pieta in the center without taking damage is literally with Rampart, and you can't do that with a character like Catalina or even Yoraha's invincibility. Now, speaking of Catalina, I do love the way that this character plays in terms of design and character design. And outside of, I think, having this whole dodge mechanic kind of be a little bit weird. I do think that Catalina is one of the most insanely fun characters to play. Although I do think she kind of suffers from one minor issue, which is kind of having like an identity crisis. Now, again, if you take a look at a character like Yoraha or even Vayne, in terms of their kits, they don't really have to give up too much in order to gain access to the invincibility. But especially for a character like Catalina, if I didn't show you her skills, you probably would have never guessed that she actually has an invincibility that she has access to. If you just take a look at the different skills that she has available, lunge attack, that does damage, another attack that does damage that also increases stun, another skill that is ranged and also deals damage, and then outside of this Ares ability, which again is just for players that do want to gain access to Ares quicker and they don't want to have to manage his whole staying alive or staying spawned as opposed to dropping his uptime complicated jibber jabber. This character does not actually have that much room to fit stuff like, again, the summon Ares alongside the invincibility and also do significant damage. Now, as a final note, the identity crisis thing is kind of reinforced even further because I didn't even mention the fact that she also has a crowd control in the form of freeze also available as a skill that you could take. So long story short, if you want to make the character a little bit more playable as in you want access to Ares quicker, you have to take Azure Sword, which again, you arguably don't need, but you also have access to a heal, you also have access to a Glaciate, and you also have access to an invincibility. You could literally take four skills that don't do effectively any damage whatsoever and pretty much be entirely skill capped, all while still wanting to technically do damage. And even though she has access to all these skills, you ultimately do still want to do damage with Catalina and however you end up fitting the crowd control or the invincibility is totally up to you. But it is of course worth noting that she has an insane amount of utility basically while supposing to be like a big DPS threat as well. It's really weird, but the identity crisis is real with this character. I feel bad thinking about it. Another fun fact, if you didn't know about the invincibilities that was also pointed out by Starmie, if you are using Catalina's invincibility, it works a little bit weirder as opposed to the other characters. And again, if you are using any of these invincibilities and trying to pair them or trying to use something like flight over fight and time your perfect dodges, some of these invincibilities will be more prone to messing up your rotation 
and Catalina's is definitely the biggest offender of such. So just keep in mind when you are either giving invincibility or receiving invincibility that the timing of things matter a lot. So just be careful and just keep in mind that although you are invincible, it doesn't last forever and you do need to still continue your combo. Now that we've moved past the triplets in terms of invincibility, let's talk about Zeta. Now the thing about Zeta is that she has a load of stun, she does insane damage, and she has a lot of flexibility all while being pretty fun to play, but that doesn't really have any bearing on where she places on this tier list. Now, as I do very well in this video, I love to quote Starmie. It kind of makes sense if you look at the kit of Zeta to kind of notice the different features or functions that kind of make her really good. And that is, of course, the crowd control that she has. That's the airborne damage that she has. That's the evasion and the evasiveness that she has in her kit. And also the fact that most of the time when you're flying in the sky, you ignore certain mechanics that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. And as like with a character like Charlotta, if you're able to deal with Lucilius easily, that just instantly bumps you up a little bit. Because again, that's the relevant content right now. And he definitely is a pain, especially if you don't have the hya hya of Lancelot going on in the background. Now again, beyond having the different buffs that you have access to doing stuns and honestly just flying around the place doing a load of damage this is a character that is primarily focused on doing damage while also having crowd control and honestly if it weren't for the fact that paralyze is just kind of worse than glacia in most cases this character would definitely be comparable to some of the higher dps like a character like lancelot now ultimately she does have access to a load of things like supplementary damage buff she has attack buff to herself and she does have crowd control in the form of paralyze and you'll probably notice that if she has all of these things and is kind of evasive doesn't that make her kind of comparable to a character like Lancelot? And the answer is yes, but also no. It's because ultimately a crowd control like Paralyze is nowhere near as good as something like Glaciite, especially Lancelot specific Glaciite. And given that the actual amount of evasion or how evasive you feel as a character like Lancelot is kind of just through the roof because you're literally doing damage and dodging all at the same time and you're not getting hit. That's the main differentiator but that puts a character like Zeta behind a character like Lancelot, but still a character that is definitely worth talking about is definitely really important. And there also is a bug with one of her skills where if she uses one of her beam skills while right next to the enemy and you dodge, you gain additional hits of your beam against the enemy in addition to building your SBA gauge even faster. Now, again, the name of the game recently has been bugs, unintended consequences or features or functionalities. So it was worth mentioning again that certain characters, especially like a character like Zeta, has access to certain things that increase her DPS. But it is funny because originally she did get a bug fixed with the 1.1 patch, but then they introduce another bug, which kind of also increases her damage again. So she just has a nerf and then a buff at the same time. Kind of funny. Now, if we take a moment to talk about the main character, I do want to say that a lot of people, especially at the early beginning of the game, myself included, kind of saw this character or the main character as kind of weak, kind of team focused at times, but in terms of actually doing raw DPS themselves, nowhere near as good as any of the other characters on the list. However, as soon as the damage buffs and the damage increasing aspects or bugs in certain skills were discovered, this character ended up being way, way, way better than I could ever have thought. Now, ultimately, because they aren't nearly as versatile as a character, like Io, Lancelot, etc., which unfortunately is kind of the benchmark for a lot of these characters. I find that the captain is definitely in the A, maybe middle of A, maybe low A plus tier. But in terms of utility, in terms of viability for damage, the captain kind of falls short among his peers. Now, again, they do have a damage cap bug, which is extremely funny because they removed it from other characters like Rackham, Percival, or even Gondagoza. But the captain, for whatever reason, still has their damage cap bug, which I don't know if that's intended. It's probably not intended, but they never got around to fixing it. But for that reason, and for pretty much that reason only in terms of damage and in terms of utility, I definitely think that the captain is definitely an A tier character. If you just take a look at this character and like read some of the abilities or skills that you have access to, you have defense break, you have attack down, you have attack buff, a heal, a slow, a revive, debuff immunity. There are so many skills for this character that it's kind of mind boggling that this character isn't super, super high tier, but in all honesty, the reason why this character among all the other characters and given how many skills they have is not in the upper half of the high, high tier is because ultimately defensives outside of a bubble are not nearly as important or nearly as insane as again, just doing outright insane damage with a character like Narmaya, Charlotta, or even Vasaraga. Now, if there were more hard crowd control abilities like Glaciite, Stun, etc., for a character like the captain, then their placement would definitely go up. But in terms of what actually feels justified, the damage that they do is decent, 
definitely above average compared to some of the other characters just because again they have access to the damage cap bug but again having the damage cut in the defensives is kind of nice but in a perfect world you would either just have the invincibilities or just not have your captain get one shot because you decided to stand in bubbles instead now on the topic of damage capping and i know we've been talking about this a lot let's get the elephant out of the room let's talk about percival now the thing about percival is that formerly he had an insane amount of damage and honestly the bulk of his skills do a decent amount of damage and that alongside having Having the stout buff makes him one of the most consistent and like high consistent or like stable dps in the game but as with the changes to his bugs or his kit or the intended features of how to play him he's obviously dropped a load of dps now i've seen kind of mixed responses from a load of different players i've seen percival mains that have basically all shoot away because they can't do the bug and i've seen people that still continue to use him without the bug but rely on his stun output and his damage output to be a fairly reliable character and so for me i don't actually think i can put him below a and that's about where star Army and I both agreed on because ultimately, even if you wanted to drag a character down to B+, because again, they've lost kind of their competitive edge in terms of damage, or they've lost their competitive edge in terms of giving buffs, that doesn't mean that the stun power and the overall versatility or the packaging of the character isn't worthwhile in general now what all that means is essentially the stun power is still worth taking and again for fights where you do need a lot of stun power i.e lucilius where you're just barely off from activating a link time stuff like his stun power is really really important pair that with the fact that again he's still a very solid damage dealer means that he definitely comes ahead of some of the other characters that we'll talk about on this list and to be honest with you guys when we get to the b plus and the b you'll kind of understand why percival is pretty much not in the same category as these characters moving back to percival for a second Second, though you do have to kind of consider that this guy does have a load of buffs and kind of utilities that you can provide either to himself or to the team in the form of again stout heart he has the attack and defense increase he has petrify which is kind of like a different sort of crowd control not the same as you know your your typical slow he provides himself supplementary damage buff that's really insane beyond anything else again giving yourself stout or being a consistent stun damage dealing character kind of puts you high in value especially in fights where all you need is the link attack to bypass a certain phase or to enter link time and then do infinite damage formerly i definitely would have put him alongside characters like io and vasaraga especially before the lucid fight came out because again having so much damage alongside the crowd control and the buffing was just absolutely ridiculous but because he's been nerfed or he's been adjusted after the fact i don't know if i would necessarily agree with quite the insane doom posting that i've seen from certain players about percival he's still solid especially if you're going to be using him in fights where you need to activate link time but you'll definitely feel the decrease in damage make no mistake and now we finally made it to the low tiers now for better or for worse these characters have either been nerfed have never been good or have kind of just been kneecapped which is kind of a crime but no one's reporting it to the police now i do hear you guys about ganagoza he's the first of our low tiers and unfortunately although it does feel like he has a load of tech to kind of you know make some of his skills faster and it doesn't quite feel like he's just a hulking big brute that has to sit through and punch very slowly they did remove the damage cap interaction with this sba which kind of nerfed him down to the former feeling that people had or down to the former state that people knew and kind of were familiar with when it came to Gondagoza, which is that ultimately there is kind of no good reason to play Gondagoza unless if you are kind of just a Gondagoza enjoyer. Now again, he has some flexibility when it comes to evasion. He does also do okay amount of damage, but in terms of actual utility, this character has no real value outside of, I guess if you want to use the Vern skin, I really, I really liked it doing the Vern skin. Now you're probably looking at the rest of the tier list and wondering how if Gondagoza has pretty much nothing good coming along for him how could any of the other characters even be comparable and the honest to god truth guys if it weren't for the fact that his damage is kind of decent compared to some of the other characters he would definitely be lower he is in an absolutely weird wacky state right now i cannot believe what they did to him honestly i can but i cannot believe how much of an effect it actually had towards how good or how usable his kit is rest in peace gone to mains i will see you in the next balance patch now the next character on this list is definitely not nearly as bad i know again i have this character behind gone to but honestly if you wanted to put her ahead of him i definitely think that fairy is in a less playable state than some of the other characters on this list definitely worse than any of the characters in the a if you didn't know what happened they basically reduced her sba game but as starmie states as the resident secondary fairy main fairy basically lost a huge chunk of her power after losing the insane sba generation that she used to provide but now in addition to not being that good of an sba generator she also has to live with the fact that during link time she kind of does nothing because if you aren't familiar a lot of 
of what fairy used to do or fairy players used to do was kind of just jump attack and utilize the sva generation through that to kind of make her useful but since you can't actually do anything with her skills during her link time or during a link time her damage and her overall usability has definitely faltered and of course guys if a resident fairy main is starting to use words like copium and their justification for why a character could be usable then you know this character is definitely fallen from grace okay now moving along the low tiers again this is specifically from starmie's list but one of the things that we definitely agreed upon is that it is cool but he does way less damage compared to most of the other characters and even though he can technically multi-hit with his laser beam that does a load of damage his actual usability and the team utility makes him very 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 niche now although in the story he was a super super giga chad something that is actually really really annoying about it that i wasn't even aware of is that you can actually rune freezes with his built-in burn functionality now again i'm not sure if any of you guys have even played with an id i personally have only played with an id maybe like two or three times total but if you actually end up ruining freezes or a crowd control with something like a burn that you are forced to have in your kit that instantly makes you much much worse now ultimately there are a load of different ways to play id and there are certain techs like being able to do the double slow tech with his dragon form and stuff like that. But something that is actually really, really, really obnoxious is that his whole gameplay cycle revolves around going into human form after being in dragon form. But something that a lot of people won't tell you about it is that if you end up dying for whatever reason in between you know forms or during your cycle or if you ever end up getting down your whole rotation of being able to perfectly time your dragon into into human form into doing big damage just goes away and you have to restart from the beginning now again this isn't even talking about if you have any buffs on you it literally just means that if you die during the cycle unlike any other character like a lancelot or an armaya or something where you'd just be able to get up rebuff up or you know just continue your cycle and it doesn't feel that bad it feels really really bad damn near paralyzed ironically enough if you are actually down even for one moment now it's finally time for us to talk about the bottom of the low tier the first character on the list that honestly feels really really bad it's rackham rackham rakam however you want to name him unfortunately the damage cap nerf that they did to this character really makes him unplayable and this paired alongside the fact that it's much easier now to get asherite splendors and damascus ingots you yeah, doing lucilius or you know doing afk with something like lancelot kind of drops all value from actually playing rackham at all if you want to gain access to more asteroid splendors you'll just do something like lucilius and just again do something like the steam turbo controller thing with lancelot or if you actually want to be a real character and do dps or have any feasible viability in terms of damage then you could pretty much pick any other character on this list outside of rackham to do damage utility give team-wide sba gauge or buffs etc all in all it is really unfortunate because rackham was definitely one of the more insane characters especially with the whole jump charge you know infinite loop where he would do an insane amount of damage especially to the dummy now as a short aside i do want to talk about the fact that for dummy parses i've seen a bunch of people fake their damage i've seen a hundred million armaya i've seen 200 million on characters that are just obviously cheated but the thing and the reason why you can definitely tell that this rackham nerf was insane is because rackham was actually looking like one of the cheated runs but it wasn't cheated at all and people were literally doing upwards of 78 79 million damage with this bug now mind you how easy or how realistic it was to pull off this combo is completely subjective but for a character like this to actually have comparable damage to something that is literally cheated in is absolutely ridiculous and it is kind of unfortunate that now anyone that mains rackham has pretty much disappeared from existence all the rackham players have either gone now to playing something like lancelot or any of the other characters basaraga oigan etc i wish you guys had seen just how ridiculous it was in the rackham discord earlier when everyone just dispersed everyone said goodbye for the final time now there are few to no people that are actually still playing rackham but if you are salutes to you thanks for being loyal okay now the final two characters that we had to talk about need a little bit of context now again in all honesty the whole point that i made about rackham was that he just had such an insane fall from grace that honestly putting him in the b tier is kind of appropriate because there's likely not going to be anyone that is still continuing this kind of you know charge shooting in the air kind of playstyle. and although he does have one of the coolest dodges in the form of the jojo dodge thing not many people are going to be playing rackham instead of again a character like io or oigan unless you really just like rackham period but the thing about siegfried and rosetta is that these characters do have some sort of utility or have some sort of niche they're just kind of missing certain aspects of their kit that kind of make them feel much worse to play now for rosetta it's the fact that her plants literally don't apply supplementary damage which i don't know if that's just like a coding thing or if it didn't make sense her sba generation is actually pretty significant and if it weren't for 
with the fact that literally she does no damage whatsoever, mainly due in part because again, why doesn't supplementary damage work on her, her plants? She would do way, way, way more damage and be much, much, much better. Starmie again is right on target with their assessment of Rosetta saying that honestly, like I mentioned, lowest damage in the game. And although there are a lot of buffs that you provide, either the buffs are insignificant or they're kind of already taken into consideration when building your character. If you even just take a look at the skills or the abilities available to Rosetta, they don't look necessarily poor. It looks like, again, you play around the roses, you're supposed to do a lot of damage or you debuff or you provide buffs to your team. But ultimately, none of this matters if you're doing such insignificant damage or if the buffs are so replaceable that any other character would work in her place. Now, again, to be clear, among all these different characters, that isn't to say that you can't play a character like Rosetta or you can't win with a character like Rosetta. It just feels a little bit unfortunate or almost like a lost opportunity a missed opportunity for side games or the balancers of the game to actually give her an interesting or significant kit. I've seen plenty of people actually try Rosetta, and although I do appreciate the fact that they heal or they provide buffs, it ultimately doesn't matter when you see really, really low damage or if I wasn't taking any damage or if I had the buffs to begin with. And honestly, although he is one of the coolest looking characters, this character has a load of problems as well. Now again, to be clear, he does do okay damage in some scenarios and he does have a load of stun power even with all of the defensives the debuff immunity and the drain that he provides a lot of characters kind of don't make use of these too well either because they hit their caps early they aren't taking any damage or even in the case of the providing drain and debuff immunity number one it's hard to time because basically you have to just guess as to when someone is going to get hit by a slow or get hit by a debuff. And in terms of drain, this is a multi-hitting thing. So unless if you're a multi-hitting character that can actually make use of the drain, why would you even need the drain? I've seen a couple people mention that if you want to run drain with a character like Lancelot, he multi-hits and he does a load of drain. And again, he has good value for it, but that's assuming that Lancelot even gets hit, which again is kind of impossible because he has flight over fight, he hits damage cap. And in terms of synergy between Siegfried and Lancelot, it's just not there. It's unfortunate, but the truth is, is that ultimately Siegfried is arguably maybe the worst or tied with the worst character in the game. Although again, if you need stun power, he's your guy. So at the end of it all, guys, as you can see, there's a bit of variance between the different tiers in terms of what could be moved up or down. Ultimately, if you're at the bottom of A+, or at the top of A, your placement isn't that significant. I personally didn't order the characters too much in terms of uh, where they belong in the A tier, and our lists, in all honesty, mine and Sarmi's list, look pretty similar. But that's pretty much just because in terms of pairing and in terms of literally just the general eye test in any research or any research that you do into these characters, a lot of them kind of just plant where they are right now. If you want to place a character like Rackham or, you know, a character like Anagosa up or down, that totally makes sense. But otherwise, a lot of these placements of these characters can't really change because they kind of just nerfed a bunch of the characters and didn't compensate for any of their damage. And therefore, with that kind of, I guess, kneecapping in mind, characters like Percival, Fairy, etc., all of them kind of are where they are and they deserve to be where they are just because of the 1.1 balance changes. Now again, to be clear, as a final disclaimer, this isn't a tier list to say whether or not you should, can, etc., play the character. If you love the character, by all means play them, but this is just what Starmie and I kind of went back and forth on until we found our exact lists or were firm on certain characters' placements. And to be clear, our lists definitely differentiated a little bit earlier on, but after discussion, looking through videos, and just doing analysis from either online play or through videos, this is kind of where we landed on our placements. But that's gonna be it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed, I hope you learned something. Thank you again to Starmie for, number one, opening my eyes to a bunch of interactions that I didn't understand, but also because Starmie's kind of a god gamer and I kind of just sit here and do supplementary damage 5 plus farming all the time. In any case, guys, if you enjoyed this content or Starmie's content, feel free to check out my socials and their socials. I'll leave the link to their channel and all of their socials and stuff in the description box down below. But again, thank you again to Starmie. Thank you again for everyone that's watched, that's been supporting me. I appreciate it so much. I will see you all next time. Make sure to check out the rest of my socials. I'll see you on the next one. Good night.